Thanks for watching. This is SkyFi Audio coming at you from Glen Rock, New Jersey. Uh, please visit us online at skyfiaudio.com and subscribe to our channel for more of these videos. Today we've got a Mark Levinson 31 Transport. This is a significant piece of equipment. Uh, came out in the early 1990s at a tune of about $8,500. In 1992, that was a ton of money. Uh, and it was a time when stuff didn't cost that much. Now it's very common to find a transport for 10, 20, 30, or $40,000. Back then, $8,500 was uh, quite unusual. And um, this wasn't just $8,500 because of tons of marketing and glitz that they put on it. This was an actually engineered and incredibly well-built machine worth every penny. I'm sure the manufacturing costs were extremely high for this unit. Uh, so $8,500 in 1992 is about $16,000 today. Um, and if uh, they were able to make something like this, it will be uh, well priced. So it features a bunch of neat things. There weren't a lot of top loading uh, transports back then either. Um, so that was a, a neat thing for Mark Levinson. This was their first top loader and possibly their first uh, CD player altogether. Now let's, let me clarify, uh, this is in fact a transport. <clears throat> so all it does is uh, spin a disc and provide a digital signal output. You would have needed uh, a DAC to go along with this to get music. Uh, so a DAC would have been, uh, yeah, the reference matching DAC would have been a number 30. So unusual construction, as you can see, it has sort of these two wings, uh, which are in fact power supplies at each side. I'll talk more about what those power supplies do. And uh, subsequent uh, units were essentially just this middle piece. If you look at, for example, the Mark Levinson number 37 or 39 CD player, it would have been just a small chassis like this. The reference pieces added these two massive power supplies on each side. Apart from the very obvious uh, motorized top, this thing is crazy cool. Um, it's about half an inch thick machined aluminum with a very big motor. We've, uh, we've opened these up before to have a good service look at them and the size of the motor used to control this top is uh, incredibly large for a CD player. I imagine they've got it from some other unrelated uh, manufacturing equipment. So top loader, um, in particular, this uh, unit used a um, Philips CDM4 uh, industrial laser. And that's what makes this one of our favorite transports to get. These industrial lasers are incredibly reliable. Excuse me for that. Um, this particular one is housed in 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 about. Uh, it's, it's essentially the construction of this laser involves uh, a lead chassis or sandwich that uh, weighs almost 14 pounds. So they went. They not only took the most reliable laser they could find at the time, which is the CDM4, but they. Uh, re-engineered it and encased it in, in, in a lead sandwich and it is in fact suspended if you push on the laser mechanism which is essentially this entire area here you can see the swing out laser here that swings in an arc um, and a nice bubble level here which is a neat way so you could uh, make sure your transport is in fact leveled so this whole substructure uh, is floating on springs which then in fact um, bolt to the bottom of this chassis and then this, uh, the chassis itself is on suspended feet. So it's almost like a double, um, double layer of suspension. Now, one of the neat uh, statistics that Mark Levison gives is that uh, if you were to apply a 70 G acceleration force to this player, so in other words, you were to drop it from a severe height, uh, all the acoustical and mechanical suspension would result in only a 0.4 G to the laser mechanism. So you can tell how much engineering went into this thing. Um, so um, we love the, the four mostly, uh, it's made out of mostly cast uh, aluminum parts. There's very little plastic in the laser. Um, and because it was for industrial use, it is incredibly reliable. So you would have found this sort of laser maybe in avionics in an airplane, you would have found it in industrial equipment and in, in applications that needed the most reliable lasers. So whenever we see a CDM4 or we have a CD player, we try to buy it because we know that that laser is gonna be good, regardless of what the user reports. Often we've had users report that a CD player had a bad laser and uh, 
when it's a CDM4, it's usually not. We get it in, and it'll be something else, maybe something in the power supply or maybe a mechanical issue. But um, and they are still available out there in the in the resale market if you do in fact need a replacement. But this thing's a tank; it's built to last, and will probably outlive us all. Let's go through the rest of the construction. Um, so um, we mentioned that these things are power supplies. Uh, I believe the left one uh, handles all the digital functions while the right one manages the servos. So digital and microprocessors and then all the servo function are housed in the right power supply. And you can see there's some venting here because that's really the only place where you're gonna have uh, any sort of heat build up. Uh, the other neat thing about this that we noticed when we looked inside is that the power cord, which is featured here, uh, makes its way to all the necessary points through an isolated steel conduit. Uh, so they've gone through great lengths to isolate the uh, AC from the rest of the circuitry. Um, Function-wise, we've got uh, all the controls are here on the top. You can kind of see from left to right, you've got your next track and previous track pause, and then stop, play, forward and back. Here's the stop, and here's the uh, lid, which we'll sample for you now. Quite a thump. It almost feels like a Mercedes G-Wagon door, <laughs> or something you would find in a tank. Um, it is, um, it's meant to provide two things. One is acoustical isolation. They want to make sure that sound waves don't travel and affect any of the laser components. And second, um, they want to make sure that it is as dark as possible in there. Um, lasers will perform best in an environment where there's no other light sources. So this is uh, the best way to achieve that, much better than a drawer or whatever. Um, looking at the, at the puck, um, this is surprising. This is a very light aluminum puck. It's about an eighth of an inch thick. It does use a neodymium mar magnet here for attaching to the to the laser. So if we drop a disc in place, you get a sense there of what it's like. Uh, there are sensors within the top that will keep you from spinning the record with the lid open. So uh, hitting play would actually close the lid and then speed, speed the disc up. So there's a lot about well, why they use such a light uh, mass for the, for the disc clamping system. At the time this Mark Levinson came out, there were other players that uh, would have used uh, the VRDS or a heavy mass to dampen or fix the disc to the motor. Um, it was believed by Mark Levinson that because uh, the discs have to vary in speed, uh, depending on whether you're, you're, where the position of the track is, a particular disc might have to spin anywhere between 200 to 400 RPMs. And as you fast forward be between the tracks, the disc has got to react to the speed changes and a light flywheel is going to react faster and more accurately than a heavier flywheel. So Mark Levinson took a different direction and that's why we find such a lightweight uh, clamping system. And it certainly works because when we go through the, the tracks, it, it moves very quickly between them. Right, moving to the front controls. Uh, sorry for the glare, but I think you can still make out the display. It's got a really neat uh, sort of dot matrix uh, digital display, commonly found in Mark Levinson gear. Even today, I think they still use this sort of high quality display. Um, the buttons, pretty self-explanatory in the front. We've got an in a display intensity here, uh, which would carry across all the other Mark Levinson components. Uh, you would connect other Mark Levinson components using a, a communications cable so that as you display, uh, change the intensity in one display, everything else would go with it. Just kind of neat. Display mode here, uh, essentially just, let me put something to play. The display mode here is going to give you lapse time, uh, both on the track and on the desk. So we've got four minutes left on the track. 36 minutes left on the desk. And then here is uh, the repeats for both disc and track. You can see there's like little tiny flush LEDs machined into the front panel, which is nice. Um, these are programming buttons. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. 
and also the index. And this is a pretty remarkable for the CD player. And one of the unique features to this model is that it had the ability to, you know, memorize what sort of features or settings you would like for not just every disc, but even every track. This could memorize about the 1300 discs, uh, including polarity. So if you were to invert the polarity on, on a song, for example, and save it, the next time you play that song, um, it would actually choose your favorite polarity setting, whether you liked it straight or inverted. And then moving on over here, uh, the plate, the, the standby button actually puts, just shuts off the display and the motors. It doesn't really shut down the unit. The unit's still powered up because uh, they would want it to be in a warmed up mode and ready to use. And that's why it reacts so quickly to a standby push. So once again, let's move on to the back and, and share some of the connections. So this is the digital power supply. Look at the size of this hinge required to hold such a heavy top. It is one series hinge system. Um, I think it uses Delron bushings as well. So, um, so over here we talk about the communication ports uh, for communicating with other Mark Levinson equipment. And then four sets of outputs. You've got your XLR type, AES, EBU, the SPDIF in RCA fashion, uh, the glass fiber ST, which is my favorite connection for connecting this unit, and the, uh, the Toslink, the IAJ standard Toslink output. Uh, here you see references to Madrigal Audio, which is the parent company of, of Mark Levinson, among other brands. This is the US version, 105 to 125 volts, and the main power on this side here. Pretty simple stuff. It's, again, this is just a transport, so there's not gonna be any audio outputs. Sorry for all the dinging of the computer in the background. Um, I don't have it handy, but the remote is also machined aluminum. It looks just like this. It utilizes the same aluminum buttons and um, sort of same look. It's quite a beefy remote, as you would expect with this. And this would have come with some pretty elaborate com uh, contraptions in order to secure this for packaging. I think there's a strap that actually holds the entire um, lid assembly in place, which we do have. And we do have a couple of these number 31. So if you watch this video and you want to uh, know what we have in stock, just check our website at skyfiaudio.com. And, um, you know, please subscribe to our channel. And thanks for watching.